Kerala. Today we have today we have two sessions. First session is handled by Dr. Ashwati Nath N.J., Faculty Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. She completed her PhD and MPhil from our department. Her PhD from Malvanias College, Nalanjara, Trivandrum, and also her postdoctoral from our Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. I welcome, ma'am, for the class on topic income tax. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sri Lakshmi. So I hope the slides are visible, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss with the topic income tax, and uh, the topics to be covered are basic concept of income tax, residential status, incidence of tax, exempted incomes, agricultural income and computation of income from various sets like uh, so income from salary, income from house property, capital gain, then profits and gains of, uh, gains of business or profession and other sources, and deductions uh, made from gross total income, assessment of individuals, and clubbing of income. So uh, we know tax is a compulsory payment which we are paid to the government. So taxes of two types. We know that direct tax and indirect tax. So direct tax is a type of tax where the incidence and impact of taxation fall on the same entity or the same person. And uh, also in the case of direct tax, the burden of tax cannot be shifted from the taxpayer to someone else. But on the other hand, indirect tax means the incidence and impact of taxation fall on different entities. And uh, a best example of indirect taxes, goods and service taxes, GST. And uh, comes to income tax, it is a direct tax because the tax is paid on the income earned. So that's why we said earlier, the income tax is a direct tax which uh, in which the incidence and impact of taxation is on the same person. Actually, the tax system in India, which was introduced uh, during the year 1860 uh, by Sir James Williams uh, due to uh, military mutiny at that time. And uh, we had a separate income tax act uh, that year, at that time. That was the first income tax act, uh, which was income tax act 1886. And after many amendments, the present income tax act uh, is uh, passed, uh, the income tax act is act 1961. So now we are moving on to the different characteristics or features of income tax. So as we said, uh, income tax is a direct tax because uh, the tax is paid by a person who bear the tax burden. So the incidence and impact on the same person. And uh, the actually uh, this income tax and all the rate of income tax, which is imposed and uh, recovered by the central government. So we consider income tax as a central tax. And normally we are paying the income tax on the total income. And we'll later uh, discuss the concept of total income. Actually, this is a to total income means after making certain deductions from the gross total income, then you will get the total income. And uh, an SSC is paying this income tax on the total income. And in India, we are having a progressive tax rate for income tax. That means the tax is not imposed on the, not, not imposed on the same rate. Actually, uh, we, are, we are having different slabs for different income group. So for those having a higher income, they have to pay higher rate of income tax. And another thing is that uh, in income tax, we have to pay surcharge. Surcharge means uh, it's an additional charge that an SSC has to pay on the income tax. So actually the surcharge is levied when the income of an SSC exceeds 50 lakhs and the surcharge is levied on the actually it is paid on the tax amount and not on the uh, it is levied not on the total income of an SSC but the surcharge is levied on the the total tax amount we have computed okay 
and uh, for an SSC, uh, actually this surcharge rates is different for individuals and uh, some other SSCs like firms and companies. And for uh, individual SSCs, if their income is between 50 lakhs uh, to 1 crore, they have to pay 10 percentage of surcharge. So as I said, the surcharge is paid on the total amount of income tax and not on not on the total income okay and the highest rate of surcharge which is charged to an individual SSC is 37 percentage <clears throat> for those whose income exceeds five crores so if individual SSC's income exceeds five crores they have to pay 37 percentage actually this 37 percentage uh, which is based on the all tax regime and uh, after this budget the new tax according to the new tax regime the highest rate of surcharge is 25 percentage in case of individual SSCs. so these are the percentages in case of the individual SSCs. And for the firms, if their income is more than 1 crore, they have to pay 12% as surcharge. And in case of a domestic company, if their income is between 1 crore to 10 crores, they have to pay 7% of their 7% uh, as surcharge. And if their income exceeds 10 crores, they have to pay 12% as surcharge. So, uh, he, and then, uh, so this is the case of surcharge for individuals, firms, and uh, companies. And another thing is that health and education says actually, this health and education says it's a compulsory payment. So, the all SSCs are liable to pay this health and education says, and this health and education says is paid on the total amount of tax, including surcharge. If you are a person, your income is uh, more than 50 lakhs, obviously you have to pay a surcharge. So whenever you are calculating your health and education sales, so you have to calculate it. It is the health and education sales is 4 percentage. So you have to calculate 4 percentage of the total amount of tax, including surcharge. Okay. And uh, the administration of income tax is by CBDT, that is Central Board of Direct Taxes. Actually, this is a department under the Ministry of Finance. And about the allocation of amount of income tax, normally uh, all, the, all the income under this income tax is allocated among the central and state government. But in the case of uh, some incomes like uh, income records from companies or any amount, uh, the amount of this surcharge and health and education says that no, that is not uh, shared among the state government. All other incomes are allocated among the central and state government. So these are the case of the, these are the different features or characteristics of income tax. As I said, this is the old regime and a new regime which is applicable for the surcharge. So uh, next we move on the move on to uh, income section two and section three of the income tax act uh, deals with the meaning meaning and other things related to income. As we know, income is one of the important term in income tax because income tax is charged on the total income of a person. So income is very important. So there are certain rules regarding income. So if you are uh, showing any income in the total income uh, in the total income there should be a definite source for that so without any definite source you cannot show any income in the you, know, you cannot include that income that particular income in your total income so there uh, for every income there should be a definite source for that and uh, the act doesn't make any distinction between whether your income is legal or illegal even if your income is an illegal income, you have to be included that income in your total income. We cannot separate uh, that your income is legal or illegal. Even if your income is legal, you have to be included in the total income. Like, uh, actually, it is not necessary that, uh, you, that your income received uh, regularly or periodically. Even your lump sum amount received can be can also be treated as an income. So there is uh, nothing called the, whether your income is regular or irregular. We considered every income, even the lump sum amount received as an income that also included in the total income. And another thing is, even if uh, 
you are getting certain receipt in kind or a, in a service if it's having money equivalent we consider it also as income because it is not essential that the income must received in the form of cash if you, are, if you are getting an income even if it is in a kind form but that is having a money equivalent you can consider it as an income like <clears throat> So it is immaterial that uh, whether your income is a temporary income or permanent income. That does not make any distinction that the, your income is temporary or your income is permanent. Even if you are earned that income and which is beyond a particular limit, you have to include that income in your total income. So we have heard about accrued income. We know that in accrued income means income earned, but actually they are not received that income. But according to the Act, according to the Income Tax Act, the accrue, even if the accrued income shall also be included in the total income because the SSC is entitled to receive such income. So that income has to be included in the total income. But the reimbursement of expenses is not considered as an income according to the Act. Uh, for example, if you are an employee in an organization and uh, you make some uh, traveling expenses uh, for the for maybe for any official trips and you are reimbursed that expenses. Actually, you are getting some money from the company, but that amount is already expended by you. So reimbursement of expenses is not considered as an income. Another term is sometimes the income may be plus or minus. Minus income means that is losses. Even if you are having certain losses, you have to be included that in terms of income. So these are the different rules regarding income. So uh, as we said, income means a monetary income from definite sources. The first uh, rule regarding the income was the income should be from a definite source. And these definite sources are called this five heads of income. So uh, if you are earning so different types of income and uh, you have to include that income in any of these five heads. So this definite sources are called this five heads of income. The five heads of income includes salary income or it may be uh, income from house property or capital gain, profit and gains from business or profession or it is from the income from other sources. Salary income, you know, uh, that it is an amount uh, paid by an employer to employee in consideration of his services. So whatever the amount and benefit or facilities provided by the employer to employee, that amount we are included in the salary income. And in case of uh, income from house property, we are included all those income which is arising in the form of rent from the house property. So those incomes which we are included in the income from house property and in the case of capital gains, obviously it's a profit from sale of profits or any investment. And you know that capital gains are, there are two types of capital gains, short term capital gain and long term capital gain that we'll discuss it later. And again, uh, profits and gains of uh, from business or profession. And uh, the last source is income from other sources. So uh, all other income which we are which we are not taken under other four heads, we include that income under the head income from other sources. Uh, like uh, any winning from lottery, dividend income, uh, then interest on securities, uh, like royalty. So these are the income which we cannot include in all other four heads. So we include those income under the head income from salaries. So when we are taking these five heads together, we will get the gross total income. So gross total income means the aggregate income from from the salary, from the house property, from capital gain, then profit or losses and income from other sources. So this constitute the gross total income or GTI. And the amount left after making all the deductions under section 80C to ATU, that also we'll discuss it later. What are the deductions which comes under sections 80C to ATU? So after making this deduction from the gross total income, you will get the total income. And an SSC or a person who is paying tax on this total income. 
and this total income normally which is we are rounded off rounded off to nearest multiples of 10 rupees so remember uh, we are paying tax on the total income and not on the gross total income so these are the five heads of income and another concept of income is casual income so as the word itself it is casual that means the income is non-recurring in nature or we can say uh, it's a type of income uh, the receipt uh, which is accidental or we can say uh, it's income we re received uh, without any stipulation so those type of incomes are called casual income uh, examples are uh, winnings from lottery then uh, uh, prize money from the horse races then card games betting uh, then cross crossword puzzles these are the different examples for casual income Actually, uh, there are certain provisions which are uh, relating to casual income. Uh, that means uh, the treatment for the casual income is different when you are compared to other incomes. The first one uh, is expenses are not deductible. For example, uh, if you take the if we take the example of winning from lottery, uh, you cannot deduct uh, the amount you spend for the purchases of lottery. So in normal cases, whenever you are, uh, whenever uh, there is, uh, whenever they are incurred certain expenses for earning certain income, that expenses can be deducted, uh, can be deducted, uh, fully deducted, or we can deduct up to certain extent. But in the case of casual income, whatever the expenses which is incurred for earning that particular income, you cannot deduct that. So. The expenses cannot be deducted under under uh, for the casual incomes, and obviously the set of of loss is not permitted. Maybe uh, in card games you may suffer losses, but in the case of other incomes, you can set off the set of the loss with some other heads. But in the case of casual income, you cannot set off the loss with the with the income from other heads. And again. This, there is TDS, ta tax deducted, uh, tax deduction at source. So when you win, win a lottery, if it is for 1 lakh rupees, obviously you will get only <clears throat> 70,000 rupees after deducting a tax rate of 30 percentage. So TDS is there and it is having a special rate of tax that is 30 percentage. So this is the thing related to cash and income. So those are non-recurring in nature. And the thing is, the expenses are not deductible and you cannot set off the loss if uh, you set off the losses and it is having a special tax rate that is 30 percentage. So uh, now it is who is an SSC? We said uh, every SSC have to pay a tax on the total income. So, who is an SSC? So, SSC is a person who is liable to pay tax. So, obviously, SSC is a person. And according to the Income Tax Act, a person includes an individual. Individual means a uh, normally natural person or a human being. And the, a person includes a Hindu undivided family, so a HUF. And uh, under the HUF, all persons which are lineally descended from a common ancestor, and that including their wives and unmarried daughters, that uh, that that includes the includes in the HUF. And obviously, a company is also be considered as a person. A uh, company may be an Indian company or uh, like any body of corporate uh, which is incorporated under any law. We consider it as a person and a part a firm, which means a partnership firm. AOP or BOI, that is Association of Persons or Body or Individuals. Uh, the difference is that AOP uh, may consist of uh, two or more persons. Actually, they are joined for a common purpose. But in the case of body of individuals, that is also a group of individuals, but they came together by chance. So that's the difference between AOP or BOI. And AOP or BOI is also considered as a person under Income Tax Act, then a local authority and every artificial judicial person is also considered as a is considered as a person. Artificial judicial person means uh, like a, a public corporation uh, that is established under that is having some special act or act of legislature. For example, universities. So they are an example of artificial judicial persons. So a person includes these. Uh, the, uh, these things and 
an SOC is a person who is liable to pay tax. So another term is deemed SOC. As I said earlier, uh, a person who is liable to pay tax on the on his income. But sometimes a person is liable to pay tax on some other's income. At that time, that SOC is termed as deemed SOC. SSC for some other person that is deemed SSC. For example, uh, for a minor, uh, uh, a guardian will be there. So guardian will be the deemed SSC. Or after death of a person, maybe his legal representative is considered as a deemed SSC. So that legal representative is liable to pay tax for that deceased person. So he, he is considered as a deemed SSC. He is not a normal SSC. And uh, another uh, term is SSC in default. So the word itself is made some default. That's why that SSC is changed as SSC in default. So uh, for example, uh, there are certain persons, actually they are responsible to deduct TDS, that is tax deducted at source. And again, uh, there are certain persons they have to, they are responsible to collect TCS, that is tax collection at source. You he heard about that. So that is their responsibility. If they are failed to do it, that person is considered as SSC in default. So sometimes a person, uh, it may be a company or an HUF or, a, uh, or an individual, whoever maybe is, so that a person he is responsible for doing the work according to the act, but he fails to do that. At that time, he we term the SSC as a necessity in default. So now we are moving on to the term assessment year and the previous year. So assessment year is a 12 months period. That is followed by the previous year during which the SSC has to file his return on income. So in the assessment year, the SSC have to return the income, income uh, which he earned during the previous year. Actually, this assessment year is always uh, always be 12 months and which is commencing from 1st April every year and ending on 31st March every year. But in the case of previous year, previous year means that the year in which the income earned. That's, that is the previous year. And it should not be uh, complete. Uh, it should be having a complete 12 months. Uh, for example, uh, if a business uh, is set up in September 2022, then the previous year of that particular business will be from September 2022 to March 31st, 2023. So the month, the, the total, when we are taking the total months, it need not be 12 months. So, but uh, in the case of assessment year, every time it will be 12, month, 12 months. This comes from 1st April every year and ending on 31st March. So this is in the case of assessment year and previous year. So now we are moving on to the residential status of different persons. Actually, uh, this uh, residential uh, status of a person, which is depends upon the actually the territorial connections of the person with India. Uh, that means how many days actually he has stayed in India. And based on that, this residential status of a person is determined. And the tax liability is calculated on the basis of this residential tax of a person sometimes uh, if a, sometimes a person uh, may be an indian but he may be a non resident and also sometimes a person a foreigner may be a resident for the income tax purpose because uh, normally this residential status of the ssc which is determined uh, with reference to previous year so in the previous year, how many days he was physically stayed in India? On the basis of that, the residential status is calculated. That this is this is in the case of uh, this is in the case of individuals. And uh, normally, this residential status of the SSC may change from year to year because it is strictly based on the days which he has presently stayed in India. So 
the residential status is always uh, based on the territorial connections of a person and a person who is liable to pay tax it is based on the residential status in india and normally it is calculated based on the previous year so uh, the chart shows the different types of residential status uh, normally for an individual and a hindu undivided family the residential status may be ordinarily resident not ordinary resident and a non resident actually uh, for individuals and huf they are having these three types of residential statuses but for a firm and a company or an aop doi or a local authority and for every artificial judicial person they are either a resident or a non resident in in this case uh, it is not necessary uh, whether they are ordinary or not ordinary only two distinctions is there whether is a resident or a non resident but for the case of individual and a hindu and dwarf family the residential status is of three types so uh, we are moving on to the the determination of residential status of individual actually the residential status of the individuals is determined according to two conditions are there two sets of conditions are there so we called it as first one is basic conditions and second one is additional conditions and based on this two sets of conditions the residential status of the individuals are determined so there are two basic conditions and two additional conditions are there and first basic condition says that an ssc or a person he is in india in the previous year for a period of 182 days or more that means he should be in india for at least 182 days during the previous year or it uh, here it says as or in the basic condition it is or and the second basic condition is he has been in india for at least 365 days during the four preceding previous years and 60 days during the previous year so the first one is at least 182 days and second one is at second basic condition is at least 365 days during the four preceding previous year and 60 days during the previous year so whenever we are taking the whenever we want to determine the residential status of an individual so we have to consider when we are uh, talking about the second basic condition we have to check uh, both the both the items are satisfied that is 365 days during the four preceding previous years and 60 days during the previous year so these are the two basic condition but there is an exception for the 60 days this for the second basic condition in that uh, 60 days is there so there is an exception for the 60 days in case of three types of parties they are uh, if an indian citizen who lives in india for an employment so he uh, if he left india for the for his employment purposes and another type of um, uh, category is member of crew in an internship this is a second category and third category is uh, if it is an indian citizen or a foreign national of indian origin but he is living outside india but he used to come uh, he, uh, he used to comes to india to visit his relatives so for these three categories instead of the 60 days the act consider it as 182 days so if it is for these three categories the second basic condition will be 365 days during the four preceding previous year and instead of 60 days it is 182 days for these three categories of people uh, so uh, the first category was uh, for the indian citizen who leave india for any employment purpose second category was member of crew in an internship and third category the person who is an indian origin but he lives outside india but he used to comes to you here uh, he used to come india to visit his relatives so for these three categories instead of 60 days that considered it as 182 days so this is in case of two basic conditions 
And in addition to that, we are having two additional conditions. The additional conditions are, the first additional condition is, has been a resident in India in at least two out of 10 preceding previous year. So the person should be a resident in India two out of 10 preceding previous years. And he stayed in India or he has been in India for at least 730 days out of seven years. So you just remember uh, some numbers. Basic condition, 182 days. And second basic condition, 365 out of four years and 60 days. When it comes to the additional condition, you just remember 2 by 10 and 730 out of 7. This uh, both are 7, 7. So it is very easy to remember. Second additional condition is 730 days out of 7 preceding previous year. So based on these two conditions, we are uh, determining the residential status of an individual. So how it works? So uh, if the person doesn't satisfy any one of the basic condition, we know the basic condition was he was in India for at least 182 days or 365 out of four years and 60 days. That was the basic condition. He never uh, satisfies any one of the basic condition. We consider that individual as a non-resident. Next category is resident and ordinarily resident, ROR. This is a resident and ordinarily resident. So whenever an individual satisfies any one of the basic condition and both the additional conditions, he is satisfying both the additional conditions. Additional conditions were 2 out of 10 at 730 out of 7 years. So those are the two additional conditions. So he has satisfied both the additional conditions and any one of the basic condition, we consider him as a resident and an ordinarily resident. And next category is resident and, but he is a not ordinarily resident because he is satisfying only any one of the basic condition, but not the, not both the additional conditions. So he is considered as a resident, but a not ordinarily resident. So the residential status of an individual are of three types. Sometimes he is a resident, uh, resident and ordinarily resident, resident but not ordinarily resident, and a non-resident. So if the individual satisfies any one of the basic condition and both the additional condition, we consider him as a resident and ordinarily resident. If the SSC or the, the, the individual satisfies only any one of the basic condition, we consider him as a resident, but not ordinarily. He is just a resident. He is not ordinarily resident. And uh, if he doesn't satisfy any one of the basic condition, he considered as a non-resident. So this is the case of residential status of an individual. Uh, next is the residential status of HUF or a firm or an AOP. For uh, HUF or firm or AOP, the, uh, the uh, determination of residential status is similar. So if the control and management, actually it is written as residential status of HUF, the first part uh, which is same for the firms and uh, AOP or BOI also. Uh, so if the control and management in India, which is wholly or partly in India, we consider the HUF or a firm or AOP as a resident. So you just think about the control and management of its affairs. Whether the control and management means it is a place where the head and seat, the seat and directing power was situated. That is the place of control and management. Even if it is partly in India, we consider the HUF or a firm or AOP as a resident. If the uh, control and management of this affairs wholly outside India, we consider it as a non-resident. Uh, for a uh, firm or AOP or BOI, there is only, uh, they can be, the residential status of a firm or AOP can be either resident or non-resident. If the control and management wholly or partly in India, we consider it as a resident. If it is wholly outside India, we consider it as a non-resident. But in the case of HUF, the same case is here, but for the HUF, 
we have to determine if the HUF is resident. That is OK. But we again have to determine whether the HUF is an ordinarily resident or a not ordinarily resident. So we know the control and management of that HUF is in India. We consider that HUF of a resident. And if the control is uh, control and management wholly outside India, we consider that HUF of a non-resident. And this is the same case for firms and AOP, as I said. But for the HUF, the HUF can be a ordinarily resident if the HUF karta, the karta of the HUF is an ordinarily resident. That means the karta have to satisfy both the additional conditions, then only the karta will become an ordinarily resident. So if the karta is an ordinarily resident, we consider the HUF also an ordinarily resident. If the karta is a resident but a not ordinarily resident, the HUF is also an resident but not ordinarily resident. So this is the case of HUF. So uh, the residential status of HUS, uh, HUF and the individual are only this like uh, ordinarily and not ordinarily for all those for the residential status of all other persons like sometimes they may be a resident or a non-resident. So this is a case of residential status of companies. So uh, in case of companies, we have looked into uh, just two things, whether the company is an Indian company or the company's place of effective management is that here is in India. So we have to look upon only these two things, whether it is an Indian company, uh, it is always, the company is always be a resident. If the company is not an Indian company, but the place of effective management in is in India, then also the company is a resident company. So the company can be a resident company or a non-resident company. So if a company, uh, company need to a resident company, either it will be an Indian company or the place of effective management in India. If we, we consider it as an Indian company, if not, we consider it as a non-resident company. So this is the case of residential status of companies. So uh, based on the based on this, we are moving on to the incidence of tax. Actually, uh, the incidence of tax on a taxpayer, which is depends upon the residential status, and this incidence of tax, which is different uh, to different types of residents. And incidence of tax is different to ordinarily resident. It is different to not ordinarily resident, and it is different to non-resident. So before moving to the incidence of tax, we are going to say some terms like uh, income received, deemed to be received, accrue or arise, or deemed to accrue or arise. Okay. So income received means at the receipt of income on the first occasion. Okay. So the, it is the receipt of income on the first occasion. But on the other hand, income deemed to be received means the income has not been actually received, but if we consider, but it is deemed to be received under the Income Tax Act. So that income we consider as deemed to be received. Like accrual arise means actually this is a right to receive the income. That is accrual arise. Deemed to accrual arise means that income may actually not accrued or arisen in India, but we consider we consider it as deemed to accrue, like we said in the assess type of assessee that is deemed assessee is considered as deemed to pay uh, tax for some other person. Like here also, this not that this not actually accrued or arisen in India, but we uh, deem it as an accrued or arisen in India under the income tax act. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes uh, you have. Uh, Earn some salary in India, but received outside India. This is an example of deemed to accrue or arise. So incidence of taxes based on based on the residential status. So now we can see the how this incidence of tax works on ordinarily resident, not ordinarily resident, and the non-resident. So uh, first, please uh, check the first four points. In that points, 
actually just clearly states that the income either received i have marked marked in an, another color so please take the first four points so uh, income either received or deemed to receive accrue or arise or deemed to accrue or arise in india so in these cases all types of residents are liable to pay tax that's why i put a tick mark on all these columns so they have to pay they are liable to pay tax if it is clearly state as it is received or deemed to receive or accrue or arise or deemed to accrue or arise in india if the word is there <clears throat> in all these cases all types of uh, residents are liable to pay tax whether it is uh, ordinarily resident not ordinarily resident or a non resident and uh, see the fifth and sixth point and those points are which are related to business income uh, actually uh, it is a uh, one thing to uh, remember that if the income received or deemed to receive or accrue or deemed to accrue outside in india non resident is not liable to pay tax so that you have to remember if the income received accrue arise or deemed to accrue or arise whatever may be if it is outside india then non resident is not liable to pay any tax if it is termed as outside india okay and fifth point explains that <clears throat> that uh, in case of uh, income received and accrued or arisen outside india but the business is controlled from india so the resident and a not ordinary resident is liable to pay tax but not resident is not liable to pay tax because that income was arisen outside india and the sixth point explain it it also explains the income accrue or receive whatever it is arisen outside india also the business is set up or controlled outside india in that case only resident is liable to pay tax and the seventh point which consists of income from any other sources any any other sources than uh, business or something like that so if any income which is uh, accrued or arisen outside india from any other sources the only resident is liable to pay tax and the last point that the eighth point which is uh, consider the past income so you are you have earned any income <clears throat> outside in india for the earlier years and later you are remitted to india so past income which are remitted to india later then no one is liable to pay tax so remember no one is the even the resident is not liable to pay tax on the past income so in all other cases the resident is liable to pay tax and non resident is not liable to pay tax when the income arises out of india and in the case of not ordinarily resident if the business is set up outside india and if income received outside india from any other sources than the business they are not liable so these are in the case of incidence of tax so next we move on to the exemption from tax uh, those are non taxable incomes which deals uh, under section 10 of the income tax act and uh, there is a confusion uh, whether the income is an exempted income or uh, it is a deduction so deduction means uh, there are specific items which are deducted from your income and normally these items are generally expenses or payments made towards such investments so that uh, that means the deductions but in case of exemption as certain items which are excluded from the taxation which are not comes under uh, which are not included in the which are in, not included in, included in uh, while 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 we calculating the tax these are the certain examples of exempted income i am not going to explain it in detail and we are moving on to the agricultural income so agricultural income which is it's an exempted income and uh, it deals in section 10 sub section 1 and we know that agricultural income means uh, uh, any income 
actually that is derived from the land uh, by agricultural or any process by cultivator or any sales of agricultural produce so any this kind of income we consider it as an agricultural income and as i said it is an exempted income but we have to satisfy certain conditions only when we consider it as an agricultural income uh, they are the land must be situated in india and uh, the land must be used for agricultural purposes and uh, it must be the source, source of income to avail the exemption and the only owner of that agricultural land can claim the exemption so these are the four essentials of agricultural income and uh, if you are satisfying the only uh, if you are satisfying this four essentials only if only then you will get the exemptions under section 10 <clears throat> actually these three are the different types of agricultural income and these three agricultural incomes are fully exempt under section 10 subsection 1 that income include i have already uh, mentioned that any rent or revenue derived from the land or any income from agricultural operations or any income from farmhouse or building attached to the agricultural land so if you are getting any agricultural income from any these three types so all these are all these three uh, items are fully exempt under section uh, 10 subsection 1 and there are certain income which we consider as partly agricultural income and partly business income so these are the items that we consider as partly it is we consider it as partly agricultural income and partly business income so uh, they are in case of a rubber business so uh, you are uh, you are cultivating rubber and uh, you are having a rubber business in that case 35 percentage of the income is taxable as business income and rest of the 65 percentage of the income is considered as an income from uh, like agricultural income so in the rubber business it is a partly agricultural income and partly business income so under the rubber business 35 percentage of the income that you earn from the rubber business is considered as a business income and rest of rest of the income that is 65 percentage we uh, have to consider as a agricultural income and uh, actually the cost of replanting uh, trees should be reduced uh, while you calculating such income uh, then only this partition will conduct it so this is the case of a rubber business and in case of a tea business you consider 40 percentage of the income from tea business as a business income and rest of the 60 percentage we consider it as an agricultural income and that amount will be exempted okay then in case of a coffee business if the owner of the uh, businessman he is growing and cured the coffee so he is only growing and cured the coffee in that case 25 percentage of the income from that coffee business is considered as a business income and 75 percentage of the income earned is considered as an agricultural income and in case the owner cured roasted and grounded the coffee then we consider 35 percentage of the income as business income and 65 percentage of income is considered as an agricultural income and that will be exempted so this is the case of partly agricultural income and a partly business income so in case of rubber business 35 percentage business income 65 percentage agricultural income in case of tea business 40 percentage business income 60 percentage agricultural income in case of coffee business if it is only grown and cured 25 percentage business income 75 percentage agricultural income if the owner grown cured roasted and grounded the coffee then 35 percentage business income and 
65 percentage we consider consider as a consider as agricultural income so this is the case of partly agricultural income and partly business income but in these three cases we consider it as uh, fully agricultural income and the amount uh, the income derived from these three items which we exempt fully so uh, now we are move on to the first head that is income from salary so uh, we know that salary means any remuneration paid by an employer to his employee in consideration of his services and that includes uh, monetary benefits non monetary benefits and everything salary includes all the facilities and benefits provided by the employer <clears throat> and every kind of remuneration and every kind of servant whether it is private or public or uh, it is lower uh, uh, lowly paid or a high high highly placed employees anything which is covered under the purview of income tax act that means for the purpose of income tax act there is no distinction between the wages of a laborer and the salaries of higher officials so if there is a relationship between employer and employee and he is paying up to a beyond a limit uh, we consider it as an income from salary <clears throat> so this is the definition uh, of income from salary and uh, moving on to some important points regarding salary so as i said there is a relationship between the employer and employee so it is very important there should be a relationship between the employer and employee between the payer and the payee then only we consider it as a salary uh for example uh for director of a company he holds an office under the company uh, as a director actually he is not a servant or an employee of the company so his director's fees obviously he is entitled to get a director's fee that director's fees is not included in the uh, under the head income from salary and that income is included in the head income from other sources because there is uh, there is there is not a relationship between the employer and the employee that's why the director's fees is included in uh, included under the head in income from other sources so another is uh, uh, we are always having a confusion uh, sometimes you are having a confusion on salary whether it is it is to be taken as a salary income or professional income so uh, sometimes uh, the employment is uh, merely incidental uh, to the exercise of a profession and uh, the income from such employment uh, would be professional income and those professional income are taxable under the head profit and gains of a business or profession uh, like uh, for example if a professional lawyer actually he can engage in a in a cases in any case and his remuneration from this engagement is taxable as professional earnings not as salary at the same time if that lawyer is employed in a company as a legal advisor uh, maybe also his work as a standing counsel for the company the remuneration received from by him uh, received by him from the company is considered as a salary so this is the difference this is the difference of salaries and the professional income and uh, the receipt uh, from a person other than the employer so sometimes uh, uh, the, the employee uh, will get an will get any receipt from uh, a person other than his employer maybe that is the income uh, earned which is related to this uh, maybe that income which is related uh for this uh, profession for his work but we never consider it uh, we never consider that receipt in under the head salary we consider that income under the head income from other sources because that income is received by the person uh, from a person other than his employer uh like uh, there are some other uh, points regarding salary Uh, like uh, if a person uh, who is employed in india 
but he goes on a leave outside the country and he draws a salary for the lease period there, that leave salary shall be deemed to have been earned in India. And also, if a person after having served in India and he retires from services and he settles outside India, that pension drawn by him in the foreign country is also we consider it as an uh, that income which is earned in India. And uh, one more case is that, uh, like uh, in case of any citizen of India and who is a government employee and he is transferred to one of its office outside India, he is also liable to pay tax to the Indian government and not to the foreign government. So these are the some important points which are uh, regarding salary. There should be a proper relationship between the employer and employee and the uh, difference between the salary and professional income and uh, the salary uh, the receipt from a person other than the employer. Uh, these are the different uh, important rules regarding the salary. So uh, comes to the computation of taxable salary. We know that the salary constitutes with these elements, basic salary, allowances, perquisites are there and profit in lieu of salary. And these four types, uh, these four things constitutes the salary, these four things constitute the gross salary. So basic salary is there, we are having so many allowances and we are having perquisites and we are having profits in lieu of salary and the total of this constitutes gross salary and we are having certain deductions under section uh, 16 and when you are deducting this deduction from the gross salary you will get the taxable salary so different items uh, of deduction under section 16 are first is standard deduction the standard deduction is uh, 50000 and we are having entertainment allowances. Actually, this allowances is deducted only in the case of government employees. Initially, this entertainment allowance is included in this uh, included while computing the salary, but after that, it will deduct it. And employment tax is there that also deducted. So after deducting these three items, you will get the taxable salary. So this is the computation of taxable salary. So we are moving on to the allowances. As we said, the gross salary constitutes, the gross salary means, or the gross salary includes the basic salary plus allowances plus perquisites and the encashed earnings. So there are certain allowances are there. So allowances means the payments made in cash by the employer to the employees other than the salary. So in addition to the salary, the amount in cash, that is important, the amount in cash paid by the employer to his employee other than the salary is called allowances. Actually, these allowances are uh, divided into three heads. That is fully taxable allowances and the allowances taxable up to a specified limit and fully exempted allowances. These are the three major heads of allowances so uh, moving on to the fully taxable allowances so i am uh, i take here only few fully taxable allowances due to the time constraint so uh, first one is dearness allowance and dearness pay so you know that dearness allowance means uh, this allowance is paid to employees uh, to mainly to compensate for the rise in the price level so that is dearness allowance and uh, like uh, tiffin allowances is there. Normally, this allowance, this tiffin allowances is given to the employees as a lunch and refreshment. That is tiffin allowances. Then servant allowances is there. And non-practicing allowances is there. Non-practicing allowances means uh, actually this allowances is meant for the doctors for not making any private practices. So for the uh, this allowance is given to the doctors and hill allowances is there uh, actually this hill allowances is provided to uh, those employees who's working in hill areas uh, actually this is this allowance is given to them for 
to compensate the high cost of living in the hill areas. So there is a hill allowances. Then warden allowances and proctor allowances is there. Normally, this warden allowances and proctor allowances, which is given uh, to the educational institutions, uh, sometimes uh, you know, sometimes uh, they are working as a warden in a hostel, or, or if they are working as a proctor in an institution. So for that, the employer give this allowance as warden allowance and uh, deputation allowance is there so sometimes uh, when an employee uh, is sent uh, his permanent uh, from his permanent place of service to some other place or an organization on a deputation or a temporary period then this deputation allowances is given and overtime allowances is there so when an employee uh, they works for an extra hours over and above his normal hours then the employer is giving this overtime allowances these are the major fully taxable allowances and these allowances which are included in the salary and uh, another one is those allowances which is exempt up to a specific end so in this said uh, this said actually we are having this hra house rent allowance and entertainment allowances is there and uh, for uh, th there are certain ex uh, expenses exempt up to a specific limit is there so those are the allowances exempt up to a specific limit so now we are uh, discussing the hra that is house rent allowances so uh, house rent allowances is an allowance uh, normally which is provided by the employer uh, to the employee to meet the expenditure incurred on the payment of residence for their residential accommodation so for meeting the expenditure of their residential accommodation this employer is providing this house rent allowances to the employee but uh, if the employee is living in his own house and he is getting hra or he is living in a house for which he is not paying any rent the full amount paid as a hra is taxable okay so if an employee he is living in an own house, but he is getting certain amount as HRA from his employer. They are in uh, that cases, the whole amount of HRA is considered as taxable. Actually, there is a rule for calculating the exempted amount uh, for the HRA. Actually, there are three conditions are there. The first condition is actual amount of HRA received, and second one is. 50 percentage or the 40 percentage of salary for the relevant period 50 percentage if in case if in case the employee resides in the uh, cities like chennai mumbai kolkata and delhi if any other place he resides in any other places 40 percentage of the salary or the rent paid less 10 percentage of the salary so these three are the these are the three conditions and by comparing these three conditions and least amount will be exempted so we can explain it through an example uh, for example salary of a person is 12000 12000 per month and hra received is 1000 per month and he paid rent during that period is 1920 so our first condition is actual amount of hra received so HRA received per month is 1000 and uh, the second one is 50 percentage or 40 percentage of the salary. This question, it doesn't mention any uh, cities in which the SSE is resides. So here I take the 40 percentage of the salary and the another condition was rent paid less 10 percentage of the salary. So the here uh, rent paid was 1920 and 10 percentage of the salary comes 1200 so the excess amount the excess amount of rent paid is 720 so now we are comparing these three now three amounts and we consider the least amount as exempted amount of hra so three conditions are there actual hra received excess of rent paid less 10 percentage of salary and 40 percentage of salary actual hra received as per the question is thousand excess of rent paid less 10 percentage of salary so rent paid was 1920 and 10 percentage of salary is 
10 percentage of 12,000 that is 7,200 difference is 7,720 and 40 percentage of the salary as the that employees resides other than this other as the mentioned the city so that is 4,800 so the least amount is 720 that least amount is exempted as uh, that is the exempted amount of HRA that is 720 and the balanced amount is taxable HRA that amount we should be included in the included while we calculating the salary income in this question actual HRA received was 1000 and exempted amount of HRA so calculated is 720 and the balance amount that is 280 shall be included in the salary income as HRA. So this is the calculation for house rent elements. So another uh, an another elements uh, which is specified up to limit is entertainment elements. So as I said earlier, this entertainment elements is exempted only for the government employees. Actually, this is an elements which is given to all employees, whether it is government employees or non-government employees. But for the government employees, this deducted. Initially, the entertainment allowance is included in the salary initially, but later, only for the government employees, when we are uh, deducting certain items uh, from the gross salary, then this entertainment allowance is deducted for computing the taxable salary. So uh, the least of the amount is deducted as entertainment allowances here amount received means the actual amount of entertainment allowance received then one fifth of the basic salary or rupees five thousand so five rupees five thousand will be the highest amount of highest amount deducted as entertainment elements so uh, you can, a government employee can deduct uh, up to rupees five thousand as entertainment elements so uh, some other cases like uh, special allowance for meeting certain expenditure. If uh, there are so many uh, uh, expenses or uh, uh, or there are sales, uh, certain allowances which are given by the employer to the employee for, for the performance of his duties. So that items are which is included in this session uh for like uh, uniform allowances traveling allowances like academic allowances like helper allowances so these are the common allowances uh which is given by the employee to the employee for performing his duties so uh for uh under this session the actual cost incurred for meeting such activities are exempted and the rest of the amount will be taxable for example the employer is giving to the employees uh, is a uniform allowance of rupees uh, 5000 rupees and the actual amount spent by the employer for purchasing the uniform is uh, 4000 so the actual amount spent is 4000 so only 4000 will be exempted ba ba balance 1000 rupees will be taxable and uh, which is included in the income from salary so and on the other hand, uh, there are certain allowances uh, which are provided by the employer uh, for meeting certain personal expenses. They are also exempted up to a specified limit. Some of the most common allowances which are provided uh, by the employer to the employee for meeting the personal expenses includes uh, special compensatory allowance. Actually, uh, this allowance, uh, it is uh, available, uh, uh, which is provided in the tribal areas and scheduled areas or uh, agency areas. And the maximum amount, the specified limit is 200 per month. And for another one is children's education allowance, and uh, which is 100 per child, up to a maximum of two children. Like uh, children's hostel allowance is there, that also 300 per month, up up to max, maximum of two children and also underground allowance is there 
that is 800 per month and uh, certain special allowances which are provided to the members of armed forces is there that is also exempted up to 4200 per, per month there are so many other uh, specified allowances which are provided by the employer for meeting the personal expenses these are the common allowances that's why i am putting in the slide and uh, these allowances are considered as fully exempted allowances so as i said allowances can be fully taxable allowances or the allowances exempted up to a specified limit or fully exempted allowances so fully exempted allowances include uh, foreign allowances there actually uh, it's an allowance uh, usually it is paid by the government uh, to an indian citizens outside india for rendering service abroad so for that this foreign allowances is provided and it is fully exempted under the purview of income tax act and uh, there are some sumptuary allowances to uh, high court or supreme court judges that also is a fully exempted allowances or any allowance paid by uh, un organizations to its employees that also is a fully exempted allowances and per diem allowances that also have fully exempted allowance like uh, per diem allowance which is paid for the purpose of use of hotels then boarding and lodging facilities to an employee uh, or any surplus accruing to him uh, from such allowance is exempt from tax so these are the different types of allowances which are fully exempted under the purview of income tax so now we are now we are moving on to the perquisites so we said the gross salary constitute allowances perquisite basic salary and profit in lieu of salary so allowances is over uh, now we are moving on to the perquisites so simply perquisite means any benefits attached to an office or a position in addition to this salaries or wages normally perquisite means if a benefit it's a benefit uh, which is uh, it's an, uh, it is a, it is given in kind for income tax purposes actually we limit the scope of perquisites uh, to the benefits which is uh, which is received in terms of kind but that should be having some money money equivalency or uh, which should be convertible in terms of money so in other words we can call it as those perquisites which you received in cash we can sometimes it is called as allowances so if it if that uh, that benefit that you receive in kind we termed it as perquisites so every benefit provided by the employer to the employee in cash other than the salary we termed it as allowances and the benefit provided by the employer to the employee other than the salary in terms of kind but it is having a monetary value we term it as a perquisite these are the common types of perquisites so uh, it is very the valuation of perquisites is considered a very important element of income from salary and one of the in very important perquisites given to employees is rent free accommodation and uh, rent free accommodation means like uh, when the employer provides the accommodation when the employer uh, the employer himself providing certain accommodation to the employee then it will be treated as a perquisite and this perquisite this rfa is taxed in the hands of the employee at certain specified rates uh, and the difference between this rfa and hra is that actually this this hra means the uh, hra means if the rent paid by the employee directly to the the house owner then he avail the benefit is as hra but in the case of rent free accommodation the employer himself providing certain accommodation facilities to the employees and there are certain conditions for calculating rent free accommodation so they are actually we calculate this value of rent free accommodation uh, for uh, government employees and non government employees for in case of a government employee it is a government employee the value of the rent free accommodation will be the amount determined as the government rule 
So simply the rent free accommodation for a government employee is the amount determined as a government room. But in the case, if the house is house given uh, the or the house given the accommodation given with certain furnitures, furnitures that means the accommodation provided is a furnished accommodation, then have to add 10 percentage cost of furniture. If the furniture is hired by the employer, you have to add the higher higher charges of that particular furniture. And if there is any amount which is payable by the employee to the employer and you have to deduct that amount, then you will get the value of accommodation. So if, if the employer is provided a normal accommodation to the employee, the value of RFA will be the amount determined as government rule. But in the case, the employer is providing a furnished house to the employee, the value of RFA will be the amount determined as per the government rule plus 10 percentage cost of furniture and you have to deduct any amount payable by the employee. So this is the case of the RFA calculation for the government employees. If the RFA uh, computation for other employees like is a non-government employee. It is based on the population. The uh, the rate of the uh, the rate of the RFA will be. It is based on the population. If the population uh, the accommodation is provided in a city where the population is exceeding twenty five lakhs, the value of rent free accommodation is fifteen percentage of the salary. If this is in the case, the accommodation is owned by the employer and it is a non-government employee. And second case is the population is between 10 to 25 lakhs, then 10 percentage of the salary we consider it as rent-free accommodation. And if the population is up to 10 lakhs, 7.5 percentage of the salary, we consider it as a value of rent-free accommodation. And if it is a like uh, on the government employees, we have added 10 percentage cost of furniture if the house is, house is furnished. Like here also, if the uh, employer is provided uh, the accommodation with a furnished one, we have to add 10 percent cost of furniture and we have to deduct any amount which is required from the employee. So this is in the case of non-government employees and this accommodation is owned by the employer. And sometimes the accommodation is provided to the employee by, by the employer uh, by taking rent. In that case, the value of rent-free accommodation will be the actual rent or 15 percentage of the salary, whichever is less. Like if it's a furnished one, you have to add 10 percent cost of furniture and you have to deduct any amount recovered from the employee. So this is the case of non-government employees regarding rent-free accommodation. Uh, one case is the accommodation is owned by the employer and the second case is the accommodation taken on lease or rent by the employer. So this is the case of accommodation provided in a hotel. So uh, if the accommodation does not exceed 15 days, the value of that perquisite will be nil. In case that accommodation exceeds 15 days, the value will be 24 percentage of the salary or the actual charges paid to the hotel, whichever is less, will be the value of requisite as the accommodation provided in the hotel. And uh, this very important, uh, it is, uh, it is an, uh, it another important, uh, it's a, it another important requisite as car, valuation of motor cars. Uh, so uh, actually there are two situations are there. If the first case is the car owned and hired by the employer and the second case is the car owned by the employee. So the first case is the car owned or hired by the employer and second case is the car owned by the employee. So we are looking at the first situation that is car owned or hired by the employer and that car is fully used for official use. So if the car is fully used for the official use, 
the value of that particular perquisites will be nil. That is, it, it, it will not be taxable. It will not be included in your income, salary income. If you are using this car for fully for the official use. If you are using the car fully for personal use, then the value of the value of the perquisite will be actual expense on running and maintenance. And you have to add a remuneration to driver. And there is a depreciation at 10% per annum. This depreciation. If in the case the car is owned by the employer, if the car is hired by the employer, instead of this depreciation, we have to add the higher charges. So this is the case when the car is fully used for personal use and this car is owned by owned or hired by the employer. If it is for official use, the value will be nil. If it is for a personal use, we have to make this computation. Another case is the car is used for mixed use. That, that means the employee is used the car for office, official use and personal use. In that case, if the expenses are borne by the employer, so think the situation if the car is owned by the employer and the employee used that car for the mixed use and the expenses are borne by the employer itself. Then we are having two divisions are there, large car and a small car. Large car means if the capacity exceeds 1.6 liter, we consider it as a large car. If the capacity is up to 1.6 liter, we consider it as a small car. If it is a large car, the value of perquisite will be 2,400 per month plus 900 per month driver salary. Driver salary is same in every situation that is 900. You just think about the this value. If it is a large car, that is uh, it will be 2400 per month. If it is a small car, it will be 1800 per month. So this is in the case the expenses is borne by the employer. And if the expenses are borne by the employee, if it is a large car, the value of perquisite will be 900 per month. If it is a small car, the value of perquisite is 600 per month. And you have to add the driver salary. As I said, the driver salary is same in all cases. That is 900 per month. So just remember, if the expense is borne by the employer, it is 2,400 and 1,800. If, if the expenses is borne by the employee, 900 and 600. And driver salary is 900 is there and second situation is car owned by the employee and the expenses are borne by the employer like in the previous case if the car is used fully for the official use the value of perquisite will be nil and if the car is used for the mixed use uh, obviously the employee is reimbursing certain expenses that amount reimbursed minus 2,400 per month and 900 per month driver salary. And if it is uh, a small car, amount reimbursed minus 1,800 per month and 900 per month driver salary. So this is the case where the car is owned by the employee and the expenses are borne by the employer. So this is the case. And some other uh, perquisites related uh, to this are uh, education facility. Normally, uh, this uh, in our an employer provided educational facility in his own educational institution. The cost of such education or the value of such benefit, if not exceeds thousand per month, the value of that facility will be named. So, the education facility is provided the institution owned by the employer and the cost of that education is not exceeding rupees 1000 per month. So the value of that purchase will be nil. If the cost or the value exceeds 1000 per month per child, the cost of such education in a similar education or a near the locality will be considered. And uh, we also deduct the amount required from the employee. So this is the case of educational facility provided. Uh, in the uh, owned educational institution by the employer. 
and uh, in case of an interest free or concessional loan if the employer is providing any concessional loan up to rupees 20000 the perquisite value will be nil if the employer is providing this uh, concessional or interest free loan to the employer above rupees 20000 uh, and a rate charged per banner uh, rate is charged which is equal to the rate uh, which is charged by the state bank of india that is the case of interest free loan or concessional loan and in the case of gift gift is also considered as an another perquisite so uh, sometimes the employers are given uh, gift uh, on the occasions of certain social occasions or religious occasions uh, like uh, christmas diwali and at the time of anniversary of the organizations so such gift are exempt up to only rupees 5000 <clears throat> the such gift up to 5000 in aggregate during the previous year only exempted and if the gift made in cash or convertible into cash that means if the gift is like a uh, gift check it shall not be exempted so in all other cases the gift of rupees 5000 will be exempted and another case is provident fund actually there are three types of provident funds are there uh, statutory provident fund recognized to provident fund and unrecognized to provident fund so in case of recognized uh, statutory provident fund and unrecognized to provident fund interest and uh, uh, interest and employees contribution to this provident fund are not included in the salary but in the case of recognized to provident fund employer contribution in excess of 12 percentage of employee salary and interest in excess of 9.5 percentage of the salary will be included so in the case of spf and unrecognized to no provident fund no amount no amount will be included while we calculating the income uh, from salary but in the case of recognized to provident fund the employer contribution and also interest on uh, interest on recognized to provident fund will be included in the salary so these are the things about salary uh, in income from salary so we have discussed about allowances there are uh, fully taxable allowances and allowances uh, which are exempt to a specified limit and uh, we have discussed about perquisites so actually due to time constraint actually uh, i know I, I i take the class a little fast sorry for that and uh, due to the time constraint, I'm stopping here um, with this income from salary. And we'll continue the rest of the portions and uh, we'll discuss the previous year questions in the next session. Thank you. Those who, who have any doubts, you may ask now. Thank you, Miss, for giving us wonderful session. Our ne next session handled by Miss Aisha Ladida MS, Research Scholar, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. She is a JRF holder. Over to you, ma'am, for the class on topic human resource management. Good evening to all.
കേൾക്കാവോ കേൾക്കാം Today I discuss about human resource management. First of all, we can see the syllabus. Human resource management, concept, role and functions of human resource management, human resource planning, recruitment and selection, training and development, succession planning, then compensation management, job evaluation, incentives and fringe benefits performance appraisal including 360 degree performance appraisal collective bargaining and workers participation in management personality perception attitude emotions group dynamics power and politics conflict and negotiation stress management organizational culture organizational development and organizational change The syllabus has two parts. First, first about human resource management and then organizational behavior. We can go to the topic. First, what is HR? Human resource management is a process which consists of four main activities, namely acquisition, development, motivation, and maintenance of human resources that means uh, it includes four main activities acquisition means uh, re recruitment of employees then development means uh, provides uh, opportunities for their overall growth motivation means inspiring them to work more maintenance means retaining human resources next step, definition according to edwin b flipo Human resource management is the planning, organizing, directing, and controlling of the procurement, development, compensation, integration, maintenance, and reproduction of human resources to the end that individual, organizational, and societal objectives are established. That means proper utilization of human resources. for the benefit of both the organization as well as individual and it helps for the overall development of the society inherent part of management we know that management means getting things done through the efforts of other people that is management deals with the people people means human beings therefore human resource management is the inseparable part of the management second one pervasive function pervasive means universal application it is applicable to all type of organization and all sections then third one basic to all functional areas human resource management is applicable to different functional areas like production operation purchase marketing etc then people centered hr deals with the human being so we can uh, told that it is people centered then involves personal activities human resource management is highly employee oriented then based on human relations it is focused on relationship between employer and employee and the relationship among various employees then action oriented function action oriented function means it is more practical approach then in human resource management we focused on needs and wants of the organization then uh, people are recruited on the basis of wants of the organization then challenging function it includes more complicated tasks such as recruitment selection orientation and so on the last one science and art human resource management is same time it is a science as well as an art it includes a systemized body of knowledge in that sense we can say that it is a science 
and uh, at the same time it, it involves a personal skill so we can say that it is an art type next area scope of human resource management first one <laughs> human resource planning human resource planning is the anticipation of the future manpower requirement that is it is the estimation of future requirements then subject one employee hiring it means appointing right number of employees then next recruitment and selection recruitment and selection means searching for prospective employees then orientation and placement orientation means the special kind of training provided to new employees then employee and executive remuneration remuneration means uh, salary wage and all other uh, bonus or um, allowances paid to employees Then motivation. Motivation means inspiring employees for generating more output. Then employee maintenance. Employee maintenance means reducing employees turnover and retaining the existing employees. Then good industrial relation. Here uh, industrial relation means a relationship between employer and employee as well as relationship among different employees. Then human welfare. Human welfare may be economic and non-economic welfare. Economic welfare means a reasonable salary, wage, allowance, etc. Then non-economic welfare means provide a good working condition, reduce stress, etc. Next area, functions of human resource management. The functions can be classified into managerial functions and operative functions. First, the point we discussed about the managerial functions. First one, planning. Planning means uh, determine what the requirements in our plans. Uh, what are the requirements? Then, what are the sources of human resources? Then, what are the training methods uh, provided to them, etc. Second one, organizing. Organizing means fix the authority and responsibility. Third one, directing. It is concerned with getting work done through subordinates. Next, controlling. The controlling process involved establishment of standard performance, measurement of actual performance, and comparing actual with the standard. If there is any deviation, take corrective actions. The last one, coordination. Coordination means entire activities of the organization are to be properly coordinated to achieve organizational goals. These are the important managerial functions. Then operative functions. Operative functions are procurement, development, compensation, integration, maintenance and motivation, and emerging issues. First one, procurement. Procurement is concerned with the appointment of right person for the right job. That is, acquisition of the adequate and suitable human resources. Then, development. Development is concerned with the development of employees by increasing their skill and proficiency. It means the overall development of the employee. Then compensation. Compensation means remuneration paid to the workers. Next function, integration. Integration means the personal manager should reconcile the interest of workers with that of the organization. Then uh, next one, maintenance and motivation. 
maintenance means retaining the existing employees and the motivation means inspiring the employees to achieve the goals then last one emerging issues emerging issues concerned with the personal report personal audit personal reach and human resource accounting these are the functions of human resource management then human resource planning human resource planning may be defined as the process of determining manpower requirements and the means for meeting those requirements in order to carry out the integrated plan of the organization manpower planning is the process including forecasting developing and controlling by which a firm ensure that it has the right number of people and the right kind of people at the right places at the right time doing work which they are economically most useful it involves forecast of the manpower needs in the future time period that is in short human resource planning needs and expectation of the future manpower requirements it estimates the future requirements and it uh, takes a plan for that then human resource planning objectives first one ensure optimum use of human resources currently employed that is the optimum utilization of the existing employees then second one avoid imbalances in the distribution and allocation of human resource it means uh, ensure the balance in between distribution and allocation of human resources distribution and allocation of human resources means uh, provide a adequate number uh, there is no uh, there is no over and under uh, recruitment of human resources it is the right number of human resources at a time the next one assess or forecast future skill requirements of the organization's overall objectives then estimate the future skill requirements in the um, organization the next day, provide a control measure to ensure availability of necessary resources when required human resources is a most a precious uh, asset in the uh, organization so uh, they, and at the same time it is more uh, risky to control them so uh, proper controlling measures are uh, set in advance next to control the cost aspect of human resource control the cost means reduce the uh, cost of human resources then last one formulate a transfer and a promotion policies transfer means shifting an employee from one job to the similar kind of job promotion means uh, shifting an employee from one job to the higher position next one recruitment recruitment is the very important aspects in human resource management then recruitment is the primary step in employment process which aims to ensure sufficient manpower to the organization according to edwin b fico recruitment is the process of searching for prospective employees and stimulating them to apply for jobs in the organization it is a linking activity between employer and job seekers it is importantly noted that it is an activity between employer and external parties not the employees employer and the job seekers they are the prospective employees of the organization then there are two sources for recruitment first one internal sources and next external sources internal sources includes promotion demotion and transfer promotion means shifting an employee uh, to higher position demotion means shifting an employee to lower position then transfer transfer means shifting uh, from an employee to similar kind of position there is no um, low, lower 
higher authority. And second one, external sources. External sources includes advertisement. Advertisement uh, means advertisement uh, given to newspapers, television, social media, etc. Then employment exchange. We are familiar with that term. Then uh, the job seekers are exchanged with the employment exchange. Then we can use such exchange for uh, recruiting employees. Then past employees. Past employees means uh, relieving employees or retiring employees. We can use uh, that person for recommending employees. Then private placement agencies and consultants. The organizations uh, also use such agencies for recruiting employees. Then walk-in interview. Walk-in interview means uh, the organization conduct interviews for recruiting employees. Then campus recruitment uh, depends on colleges, universities for recruiting employees. Then trade union. Next area, the stages of recruitment. There are five stages in recruitment. First one, recruitment planning. Recruitment planning means plan the requirements of uh, future, uh, plan the requirements of human resources. Then all aspects, complete details, uh, details of recruitment are uh, pre-planned uh, pre for setting advance. The next uh, strategy development. Uh, strategy development means form or develop a strategy which is suitable to our requirement. Uh, then searching. Searching means seeking employees. Then screening. Screening means uh, evaluating the applicants. Then last one, evaluation and uh, control. Evaluation and control means uh, detailed evaluation of the screened candidates. Next one, selection. We know that the recruitment is a positive aspect and the selection is a negative aspect. It is an elimination process. We can see selection involves picking a group of workers from a total group of workers who has applied for job. It involves both the select the fix and eliminate the unfix. That is why we can uh, call that it is, an it is a negative aspect. There is a chance for eliminating the unsuitable or unfit candidates. According to Thomas Stone, selection is the process of differentiating between applicants in order to identify those with a greater likelihood of success in a job. Then selection procedure selection uh, is a, a com complex process it involves uh, many steps the first one receipt and uh, scrutiny or application pool application pools uh, means uh, notification of vacancies then applications are accepted up to a particular date companies notified the vacancies and invite applications for that vacancies. The next second step is preliminary screening and interview. It is usually conducted by assistant or secretary of HR department. This is for this is conducting for eliminating or rejecting the unsuitable candidates. Third one application blank or application form under this step applicants who are selected at the preliminary interview are given blank application form in that blank application form includes the blank application form it is given for filling the details about the candidates the candidates can be filled with their biographical details educational attainment work experience etc then selection test. Selection test means various tests are uh, conducted for uh, measuring the quality of candidates. 
the testing groups attitude test personality test interest test performance test intelligent test and knowledge test the next step interview we know that the interview is a face to face contact between interviewer and interviewee here interviewer means the employer and interviewee means the employees for employees not the job seekers or candidates then background investigation background investigation means checking reference under this step the employer can conduct inquiries about the candidates from previous employer or referee then next step approval by appropriate authority after uh, the above process uh, then we can get the approval from the authority the name and details of the candidate selected is sent to the supervisors for approval then physical exam it means medical test that is uh, some job requires uh, medical report for uh, um, determining their physical fitness then final employment decision it means giving appointment order to the selected candidate the next day, placement placement means giving a particular position for selected candidate then last one induction or orientation induction or orientation means uh, providing special kind of uh, training programs to newly selected employees for introducing the job and the organization to them next one training training is the organized procedure by which people learn knowledge and skill for a definite purpose according to flipo training is the act of increasing the knowledge and skill of an employee for doing a particular job the main purpose of training is to bridge the gap between job requirements and the present competencies of an employee it is the process of imparting specific skills that means training provides the employees uh, for providing uh, specific skills that is required for a job then training the types first one orientation we know that the orientation means provide a special kind of training to newly selected or newly appointed employees it is the introduction of the organization or job to the employees then second one job training job training means to increase the knowledge and skill of employees it helps to reduce accidents wastage etc uh, that is uh, provide knowledge and skill about the job to the employees it is uh, it includes details about the job in the case of orientation uh, orientation means details about the job as well as organization but in job training it focuses only the uh, in depth training about the job the main purpose is to reduce accidents inefficiency etc then third one craft training it is given to employees in the different craft by an experienced person the next is safety training safety training aims to minimize accident it ensures the safe and security of the employees the next is promotional training this is given to existing employees to enable them to get a promotion then refresher training refresher training means uh, get new ideas or get adaptation in knowledge the last one remedial training remedial training uh, is conducted to overcome the shortcomings in the behavior and the performance these are the types of training orientation job training 
ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് ട്രെയിനിങ് സേഫ്റ്റി ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രൊമോഷണൽ ട്രെയിനിങ് റിഫ്രഷർ ട്രെയിനിങ് ആൻഡ് റെമഡിയൽ ട്രെയിനിങ് നെക്സ്റ്റ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ഓഫ് ട്രെയിനിങ് ദി മെത്തേഡ്സ് ആർ ഡിവൈഡ് ഇൻ ടു ടു ഓൺ ദ ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഓഫ് ദി ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ഓൺ ദ ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് മീൻസ് ദ ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രൊവൈഡ്സ് ഇൻ അറ്റ് ദി ആക്ച്വൽ വർക്ക് പ്ലേസ് ഇറ്റ് ഇൻക്ലൂഡ്സ് കോച്ചിങ് അണ്ടർ സ്റ്റഡി ജോബ് റൊട്ടേഷൻ സ്പെഷ്യൽ പ്രോജക്ട്സ് മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ മാനേജ്മെന്റ് ആൻഡ് അപ്രണ്ടിപ്പ് ട്രെയിനിങ് കോച്ചിങ് മീൻസ് ഓൺ ദ ജോബ് കോച്ചിങ് ബൈ ദ സുപീരിയർ ഈസ് എൻ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻ്റ് ആൻഡ് പൊട്ടൻഷ്യൽ ഇഫക്റ്റീവ് അപ്രോച്ച് കോച്ചിങ് മീൻസ് ദ സുപീരിയർ പ്രൊവൈഡ്സ് പേഴ്സണൽ ഇൻസ്ട്രക്ഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഗൈഡൻസ് ടു employees then second one understudy understudy means uh, subordinates learn through experience and observations under this the trainee work an assistant to a supervisor in the case of coaching uh, the coach or supervisor give uh, instructions and guidelines for uh, working in the workplace but in the case of understudy the uh, subordinate actually experience the for uh, his working then third job rotation the major objective of job rotation is the broadening of the background of trainee in the organization under this the trainee is uh, periodically rotated to different uh, jobs the next is special projects this is a very flexible training technique on uh, special projects nalladhu special projects konde mean cheynadhu endanu vechale സ്പെഷ്യൽ അസൈൻമെന്റ്സ് അസൈൻ ചെയ്ത് കൊടുക്കുക സ്പെഷ്യൽ വർക്ക്സ് ദ ട്രെയിനിങ് മേ ബി ആസ്പിലിറ്റി പെർഫോം സ്പെഷ്യൽ അസൈൻമെന്റ് ദർ ബൈ ഹി ലേൺസ് ദി വർക്ക് പ്രൊസീജിയർ ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ മാനേജ്മെന്റ് മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ മാനേജ്മെന്റ് മീൻസ് സെവറൽ ടാസ്ക് അറ്റ് എ ടൈം ദൻ ലാസ്റ്റ് അപ്രണ്ടിപ്പ് ട്രെയിനിങ് അപ്രണ്ടിപ്പ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മീൻസ് പ്രൊവൈഡ് special kind of training that means the uh, train subordinates are apprent- apprentices or trainees adhaid nammal ipo trainees okke aite job in aalkar edukkille appo avare actually employees aayikkilla at some point korange level ilukke salary okke koduthittu appoint cheyina type of trainees employees aayikkum mainly avare focus cheynadhu experience nu vendi aayikkum avare work cheynadhu salary കുറഞ്ഞ സാലറിക്കൊക്കെ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്ന ആളുകൾ അതാണ് ഈ അപ്രണ്ടിപ്പ് ട്രെയിനിങ് കൊണ്ട് മീൻ ചെയ്യുന്നത് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ആർ ക്ലാസ് ഓൺ ദ ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് ആൻഡ് ഓഫ് ദ ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് ബി ഡിസ്കസ്ഡ് അബൌട്ട് ഓൺ ദ ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ദൻ സെക്കൻഡ് വൺ ഓഫ് ദി ജോബ് ട്രെയിനിങ് മെത്തേഡ്സ് ഇറ്റ് ഇൻക്ലൂഡ്സ് സ്പെഷ്യൽ കോഴ്സസ് ആൻഡ് ലെക്ചേഴ്സ് സ്പെഷ്യൽ കോഴ്സസ് ആൻഡ് ലെക്ചേഴ്സ് മീൻസ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് സിമിലിയർ ടു ക്ലാസ് റൂം Uh, lectures then mm, give mm, instructions and guidelines for uh, working in, work, working the job then second one conferences conferences means different employees comes together to discuss the various aspects of a particular topic then next is case studies case studies means in depth detailed examination of a particular case the next day, brainstorming brainstorming means maximizing the participation and minimum of criticism criticism then that is focused on maximum participation then vestibule training vestibule training means actual work conditions are created in a classroom or a workshop then the machines the materials and tools etc are uh, set in that area next day, classroom training it is similar to special courses and lectures then like a college or university we provide a theory information about the theoretical aspects then next day, role play the supervisor or expert act um, the details about the job then last one programmed instruction then provide detailed instructions about the particular job to employees these are the off the job training methods off the job training methods are provided outside the organization 
so we can say that it's off the job then on the job means it provides within the workplace of the job out, uh, outside or outside than the workplace the next development development aims to improve the overall personality of an individual it is a long term educational process meant for managerial personnel those learning opportunities designed to help employees to grow are known as development it helps to know the conceptual the theoretical knowledge in the case of training we focus on uh, specific skill but in case of development it means the overall growth of the individual as well as the organization provide opportunities for the growth of individual as well as organization it is not to focus on a specific job or skill it means the overall development there next succession planning succession planning is a process for identifying and developing new leaders who can replace old leaders when they leave retire or die identification and development of potential successors for key position in an organization through systematic evaluation actually succession planning is a precaution for uh, overcoming the crisis of uh, retiring or leaving or death of a key persons key managerial persons it is a precaution for uh, overcoming that crisis under succession planning we uh, develop uh, new leaders who are uh, able to uh, replace the existing leaders then the stages of succession planning first one identify critical positions then first of all we identify what are the critical positions in our organization that may be chief financial officer chief executive officer human resource manager marketing manager etc then second one identify competitiveness we hear competitiveness means competency then find out the competency of an organization then third identify succession management strategies what are the succession planning strategies of our organization next year, develop implement a succession planning develop and implement a succession planning that means we uh, provide uh, providing uh, training and uh, development opportunities to the uh, 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 leaders then evaluate the effectiveness evaluate effectiveness means uh, evaluate the effectiveness of our system and uh, take corrective actions is about the succession planning the next day compensation we know that the compensation is the remuneration according to wendel french compensation is a comprehensive term which includes wages salaries and all other allowances and benefits employees compensation refers to wide range of monetary and non monetary rewards to employee for their services rendered to the organization components of employee compensation base or primary compensation and a supplementary compensation uh, compensation is nothing that uh, it includes uh, salary uh, wage and all other benefits provided to employees compensation may be base or primary compensation and supplementary compensation base compensation means the uh, basic pay provided to employees then supplementary compensation means all uh, compensation in addition to basic salary or wage that may be allowance bonus benefits etc then next day compensation management compensation management is also known as wage and salary administration it consists of formulation and implementation of policies and programs related to wage salary and other forms of employees compensation compensation management helps the organization to obtain maintain and retaining a productive workforce it involves job evaluation wage or salary survey development and maintenance of wage structure and control of payroll cost
and essentials of good compensation management. Following are the uh, essential of good compensation management. First one, rational job analysis. Then uh, rational job analysis means logic, uh, logical analysis of the current situation of the organization. Then second one, proper job evaluation. Job evaluation means uh, work, uh, relative work of the job. Then next day, in-depth knowledge about the organization and the market force. That means thorough knowledge about the organization. That is uh, the financial uh, structure of the organization, their current situation. Mm, then prevailing wage system followed by the organization, etc. Then market forces means uh, wage provided in the similar industry. Uh, then market condition and so on. Then next, the clarity of objectives. Uh, before uh, preparing compensation management system, uh, the manager must be aware about uh, the uh, clear objectives. Next step area, job evaluation. It is the process of evaluating relative worth of a job. Job evaluation is a system where in particular job of an enterprise is compared with the, its other jobs. It's an effort to determine the relative value of every job in a plan to determine what the fair basic wage for such a job should be. It helps to determine the fair scale. Job evaluation is a systematic and orderly process of measuring the worth of job in relation to other job. Uh, that is the meaning given by Edwin D. Flipper. Job evaluation means uh, it is the relative worth of a job. That is, the job is compared with the other job. Then, uh, the, the, the uh, comparison means uh, compared with the both the cost and the benefit. That is the relative worth. The cost and benefit of a one job is compared with the, that of other job. The next area, incentives. Incentives are monetary benefits paid to workmen in view of their outstanding performance. Incentives vary from individual to individual and from period to period for same individual. An incentive scheme is a plan or program to motivate the individual or group on performance. An incentive program is most frequently built on monetary rewards, uh, but uh, they also include a variety of non-monetary rewards or prices. That is, incentives provided for outstanding performance. Compensation is provided for performance. That means uh, when we appoint an employee, we must give compensation to him. That may be wage or salary. But incentives provides uh, for their outstanding performance. Outstanding performance means they perform more than the standard or they perform more than the expectation. The kinds of incentives. Incentives may be individual incentives and a group incentives. Individual incentives means uh, the uh, incentives provided to a single person or individuals. It may be time-based or production-based system. Time-based system means actual time uh, they, were, they are worked. It may be Hussey planner, Rowan planner, and so on. Then production-based system means the output produced by them. It is also known as piece rate system. Then group incentives. Group incentives provided to a group of people or a team. It may be in the form of profit sharing or partnership. Then second category, financial and non-financial incentives. Financial incentives means monetary incentives. That is salary, premium, dividend, bonus. Then non-financial incentives. It may be delegation of responsibility, security of service, works, workers, participant, promotion, promotion, etc. That is other than monetary compensation. Then third one, positive and negative incentive. Positive incentive means uh, it creates a benefit to the employee. That is promotion, uh, premium, dividend, bonus. Negative incentive means uh, it is a penalty. Actually, uh, it is a set fine or penalty. That is demotion. 
the fringe benefits. Employees are paid several benefits in addition to wages, salary, allowance, and a bonus. These benefits and services are called fringe benefits because these are offered by the employer as a fringe. Fringe benefits are the additional benefits offered to an employee above the stated salary for the performance of a specific service. According to D. Belcher, fringe benefits are any wage cost not directly connected with the employee's productive effort, performance, service, or sacrifice. Wage, salary, allowance, and all the other employees are working at benefits. Fringe benefits. Then uh, we are familiar about the work to pay. That, uh, that is a kind of fringe benefit. Then, kinds of fringe benefits. Old age and retirement benefit. Workman compensation, employee security, safety and health, health benefits, education and recreation facilities, and interest free loans. If fringe benefits are not employees in the performance of the direct connection, they will not be able to do it. 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 The first one old age and retirement benefit. Then, retirement is not able to do it. Uh, amount the pension of a polygon amount then workman's compensation uh, then employee security security scheme like a cover to portions and barring okay then safety and healthy it like I ring provide then health benefits and then like I okay the next day Performance appraisal. Performance appraisal is the process of evaluating the individual job performance. It is the systematic, periodic, and an impartial rating of an employee's excellence in matters pertaining to his present day job. Definition Performance appraisal is a process of evaluating an employee's performance of a job in terms of its requirements. That is, performance appraisal is the process of evaluating perform uh, performance. That is, uh, what is the uh, performance uh, performed by the human resource or employees? Then, uh, these are the objectives of performance appraisal. First one, to you know the performance gap. The performance gap means what is our target and what is actually done by the employee. The performance gap is the difference between the target and the actual performance of the employee. Second one, provide a basis, promotion, transfer, etc. That means performance appraisal provides a basis for promotion, transfer, etc. That means uh, we give promotion to employees who done more than the target, then transfer of employees who done uh, below the target. Like that. The third one, Aid in designing, training, and development program. Performance appraisal is also used for uh, designing the training and the development program. That means uh, the training uh, we can um, uh, classify or uh, grading the employees as per their performance. The next wage and salary administration. Then the reasonable wage and salary can be fixed based on the uh, performance of the employees then helps in increasing employee effectiveness performance appraisal uh, also helpful for in improving the employees effectiveness because uh, the employees are alert about the, the appraisal of their performance then identify employees grievance it also helpful for identify grievance and a uh, solving ticket then methods or techniques of performance appraisal there are two methods for performance appraisal first one traditional method and second one modern method then we discussed the first one we discussed about the traditional method traditional method includes ranking method ranking method means uh, provide a rank to employees that means uh, the higher performer gives a first rank then um, next uh, higher performer gives uh, second rank uh, and so on then the uh, uh, 
the little performer gives the most least rank. Second one, paired comparison. Paired comparison means the performance of different employees are compared uh, by pairing them. The next grading method. Grading method means provide a grade on the basis of their performance. Uh, then that means the uh, best performers gives the excellent or outstanding. Then next best performers gives very good. Then next best performers gives good. Uh, then and so on. Next man to man comparison method. Under this method, uh, the performance of employees are compared with the, that of others. Then here, uh, the all uh, employees are not compared uh, in between them. Then the performance of employees are compared with the uh, most key person's performance. The next graphic rating scale method. Under this method, a scale is prepared for uh, measuring the performance. Then uh, the, uh, under this scale, uh, different attributes are marked based on that the writer uh, measuring the performance of employees. Then checklist method. Under checklist, uh, the different statements are provided. Then uh, the writer can mark yes or no options for the uh, regarding the statements about the employees. Next, critical incidence method. Under this method, the performance of an employee can be measured uh, on the basis of how he can deal with the a critical event or critical situation. The next essay method. Under this method, the just name tells that uh, description. That is, uh, the writer uh, made uh, makes descriptions or statements about the performance of employees. Then last, the confidential report. Generally, the government organizations are followed in the confidential report form uh, that under this, uh, the they made a secret reports of their employees. The next step, modern method. Modern method means uh, management by objectives. Management by objectives propounded by Peter of Drucker. Management by objective means the all activities of an organization is uh, focused to a common objective. Then uh, as per this, uh, the employees uh, by active participation are measured. Then next day, assessment center. Assessment center means the performance of employees are measured by experts. Then next day, 360 degree performance appraisal. Uh, we can discuss it uh, later. Then next day, post accounting method. Post accounting method means uh, the performance of an employee can be measured by using uh, monetary benefits. Then last day, behaviorally anchored rating scale. It is a combination of traditional method and a uh, critical incident method. Uh, then under this method, the behavioral pattern of employees are measured. Uh, that means uh, the uh, statements uh, related with the behavioral aspects are considered. Then next day, 360 degree performance appraisal. It is a method included under modern method of performance appraisal. This method is also known as multi rater feedback. This 360 degree on the advanced formula to marry to 70 degree performance appraisal. Then it is the appraisal in a wider perspective where the comment about the employee's performance comes from all possible sources that are directly or indirectly related with the employee on his job. In 360 degree performance appraisal, an employee can be appraised by his peers, managers, subordinates, team members, customers, suppliers, or vendors, anyone who comes into direct or indirect contact with the employee and can provide necessary information or feedback regarding performance of the employee on the, on the job. The four major components of 360 degree performance appraisal are employees. Self appraisal, appraisal by supervisor, appraisal by subordinate, and peer appraisal. That is the employee related to the employee directly or indirectly related to the employee. Feedback which is the employee measure the method 360 degree performance appraisal. 360 degree means all, all around the employee. 
all persons is superior more than customer supplier manager subordinates team members then all persons related with the, uh, his job and him are uh, considered under this method next collective bargaining collective bargaining according to beach collective bargaining is concerned with the relation between union reporting employees and employees or their representatives it involves the process of union organization of employees negotiation administration and interpretation of collective agreements concerning wage hours of work and other condition of employees arguing in concerted economic actions dispute settlement procedures next definition given by flipper according to flipper collective bargaining is a process in which representatives of a labor organization and the representativeness of business organization meet and attempt to negotiate a contract or agreement which specify the nature of employee employer union relationship illa collective bargaining varnale uh, under collective bargaining formed a group with the employer employee and trade union uh, for setting the um, hr policies then that means uh, fixing wage uh, uh, fixing uh, the hours worked etc then objectives of collective bargaining first one to foster and maintain cordial and harmonious relation between the employer or management and the employees that means uh, provide a good uh, relationship between employer and the employee and uh, reduce or prevent the employees exploitation next day, to protect the interest of both the employer and the employee that means consider both the employer and the employee the reasonable uh, wage um, the good working condition etc then to keep outside that is the government interventions at bay that means uh, the, there is a good industry there is a good employer employee relationship there is no need for outside intervention then as last point to promote industrial democracy that means uh, promote and provide democracy in the industry or organization then the forms of collective bargaining there are three forms first one single planned bargaining single planned bargaining means uh, the uh, group of uh, the group consists of employer and employee of a single organization it is a team uh, formed uh, by employees and employer in a organization in multiple planned bargaining it is a group of people includes uh, employees uh, from more than organization as well as employer from more than one organization then multiple employer bargaining means it in, it, it is an association of employees it in, it, it, uh, it not uh, not not includes uh, employees it is an association of employers only uh, more than one organization um, from more than one organization uh, the employers uh, build a team next area workers participation in management it is described as the influence in decision making exerted through the process of interaction between workers and managers based upon information sharing participation in decision making freedom of opportunity for self expression feeling of belongingness the main objectives are better employee satisfaction greater responsibility enhances cooperation and developing a good communication system uh all the workers participation the name is mentioned the same pole then workers in more than participation work workers in more consider the same pole a policy is form cheya adana ivide workers participation konde mean cheynathu then levels of workers participation the following are the levels of workers participation in management first one informative participation informative participation means express view of employees on general matters here uh, the uh, opinion of employees in general matters are considered then after that 
the management of one policies. Then next, the consultative participation. Under this, consulted on the matters of employee welfare, such as work, safety, and health. Here, the opinions of employees about uh, the matters regarding with their work, safety, health are considered. And in uh, all other matters, uh, the uh, decisions are uh, purely taken by management. Eh? But uh, the matters related with the employees, in the case of matters related with the employees, their opinions also are considered. The next associative participation. Under this, managers and workers jointly take decisions. Uh, it may be 50 50 participation. That is, in 50, uh, the um, half of the portions, uh, the opinion of workers are considered, uh, and in main portion, the important uh, decisions are taken by the management itself. Next, uh, administrative participation. Under this, greater share of workers' participation to discharge managerial functions. Uh, that means, uh, workers' participation in managerial functions are also considered. Next, decisive participation. Under this, highest level participations are uh, considered. That means, the majority of the decisions of the organization are taken by uh, management and employees jointly. Next, lowest level of participatory management. That means, not to share any information. Then, uh, the opinion of uh, workers are not uh, seeking. The complete uh, decisions are taken by management in itself uh, based on their uh, opinions. Last one, median level of participatory management. Under this, uh, the informations are collected but not uh, considered. That is, the opinion of workers are considered, uh, workers are uh, asked but not considered for taking decisions. These are the levels of workers uh, in participatory management. The next uh, workers' participation in management uh, essential requirements. What are the requirements of WPM? First one, support of top management. It is the very essential factor. We cannot uh, implement the WPM uh, without the support of uh, administrative employees. Second one, clarity in both policies and objectives. There should be a clear uh, vision about the uh, goal policies, uh, objectives, strategies, and all other administrative matters of the organization. Next, uh, fair and equal treatment to all employees. There is no chance, uh, there is no scope for uh, biases, biases. The next, uh, adequate access to management information. It is easy, uh, easy um, to assess the management information. The next uh, assurance against victimization. There is a proper grievance and uh, take remedial actions. The next, the next uh, respect for union strength. Uh, that the organization follow a policy which respect uh, the trade union. Next, uh, recognize the contribution of employees. That means uh, consider the uh, contribution or services provided by the employees. The next training and orientation for members. Training and orientation for members means provide uh, the training and the development opportunities to the employees for, the, uh, for their better performance. Then last, fulfilling statutory requirements. Fulfilling statutory requirements means fulfilling legal requirements. The next, uh, up to this point, we discussed about the uh, human resource part. Then we go to the organizational behavior part. Uh, these are inputs in the um, resource management. The next, the next area, personality. The term personality has been derived from Latin word persona, which means to speak through. In single words, personality means totality of a man. It essentially deals with the variations in thoughts and behavior that differentiate one person from another. Definition Gordon Alport defines personality is the dynamic organization with the individual of that psychological system that determines his unique adjustment to his environment. It refers to the capacity of a person for popularity, friendliness, or charisma. It is a function of thought, feeling, sensation, and intuition. That is, personality means the totality of a man. 
18 books their physical appearance mental uh, mental attitude emotions then all other matters it is the totality of a person then determinants following are the determinants of personality first one biological factors biological factors includes uh, physical feature brain heredity physical features means height weight then fat thin skin color and that uh, that is so all then brain brain means uh, the um, intelligent uh, then uh, mental conditions of a person heredity heredity means uh, those factors that are imported from their parents then next point the second point is cultural factors cultural factors means accepted norms of social behavior then next is family and social factors then last is situational factors situational factors means an individual personality will change according to situations so they behave they behave based on based on different situations then we do five personality traits the five personality traits are agreeableness consciousness neuroticism extraversion openness first one agreeableness agreeableness means uh, the person's ability to get to along with the others it means the social interaction the next is consciousness it refers to the number of goals on which a person focuses generally the person with the few goals are highly um systematic than others then third one neuroticism it refers one's emotional stability and a degree of negative emotions that is the emotional stability the next is extraversion it refers a person's comfort level with the relationship extraverted persons can easily deal um, with the society than introverted persons the last one openness people with high level of openness are willing to listen to new ideas and to change their own ideas these are the big five personality traits then perception perception refers to the way we try to understand the world around us we gather information through our five senses of organs what are the five senses of organs eyes nose ears tongue and a skin but the perception adds meaning to this sensory inputs the mind gets the information through five sense organs perception is a process of becoming aware of situations of adding meaningful association to sensations perception is an intellectual process through which a person selects data or stimuli from the environment different people may perceive the same situational events differently that means perception uh, means uh, the way we try to understand the world around us the way we try to around the uh, understand the our surroundings perception is an intellectual process uh, through which a person selects that or stimuli from the environment then we discuss about uh, the process of perception there are five steps in perception first one receiving stimuli receiving stimuli means uh, collected data or stimuli from the environment the next is selection of stimuli after getting the stimuli select what 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 the stimuli we need and uh, avoid or uh, uh, reject by remaining others the next is organization of stimuli that means incorporated the selected stimuli into our body that is the proper arrangement the next interpretation of stimuli interpretation of stimuli means take actions uh, based on the incorporated stimuli then last is behavior response next is elements of perception the following are the elements of perception first one stimuli stimuli means the receipt of information is the a stimulus which results in sensation 
that is the family social economic environment etc are the important stimuli for the people that is the data or information from the environment then second one attention the stimuli that are paid attention depend purely on the people's selection capacity and the intensity of the stimuli the next day recognition recognition means message or uh, coming stimuli are recognized before they are transmitted into behavior next day translation it is the process of translating message into action then first uh, collect a stimuli from environment uh, then uh, made concentration to that stimuli then next step uh, recognize the um, into our uh, behavior then next step translating message into action then behavior it is the outcome of the cognitive process perception is reflected in behavior which is visible in different form of employees action and motivation that's the performance proper behavior leads to higher performance then satisfaction then performance gives uh, gives higher performance gives more satisfaction then performance is more than expectation people are delighted but when performance is equal to our uh, then uh, slightly equal to our expectation the people are satisfied then below the expectation people are also dissatisfied then attitude attitude is fairly stable emotional tendency to respond consistently to some specific object situation person or category of people attitude may be defined as certain regularities of an individual's feelings thoughts and predisposition to act towards some aspect of his or her environment that is the definition uh, given by sequod and backman attitudes are learned from personal experience and it have a motivational qualities the important components of attitude, uh, attitude are affective cognitive and behavior then attitude means the stable emotional tendency uh, regard to some specific object the next area emotions emotion is a strong feeling derived from one circumstances mood or relationship with the others emotional intelligence refers to the ability to identify and manage one own emotion as well as the emotion of others emotion is a complex state of feeling that results in physical psychological changes that influence through and thought and behavior emotion is the mental state associated with the nervous system brought on by chemical changes with the thoughts feelings behavior response and a degree of pressure or displeasure uh, emotion is a strong feeling derived from one circumstances one situations one uh, background it is a strong feeling emotion means the strong feeling the next area group dynamics it is a social process by which people interact face to face in small group it is the study of the forces operating within a group it deals with the attitude and behavioral pattern of group then group dynamics is the social process by which people interact face to face in small group just like kudumbasri units reasons for joining a group security esteem affiliation power identity and third link then um, security means uh, sometimes the people joining a group for uh, their uh, overcoming their fear then next uh, um esteem esteem means uh, their that is uh, that uh, ego status uh, that is for acquiring uh, the um, prestige of joining a group the next uh, affiliation affiliation means status with the power the next uh, power power means uh, related with the authority next uh, identity identity means social identity the last one huddling here informal get together conducted by executives that is the huddling these are the reasons for joining in a group
the next power power means the ability of a person to influence others it may be defined as the ability to influence and control anything that is of value to others the important types of power are legitimate power reward power coercive power referent power and expert power the features of power are dependency specific and reciprocal relationship then power means uh, power is the ability of a person to influence others then uh, the important types of uh, legitimate legitimate power means it is granted to the organizational hierarchy that is the legitimate power reward power is the power to give or withhold reward that is employer employee relationship the next coercive power power to uh, force by someone it may be emotional or physical threat then Uh, referent power it is based on identification imitation loyalty and charisma then or all the character und ayal kundavun or influence that means uh, referent power uh, for example celebrities then expert power it is derived from expertise special skill or knowledge uh, that or a field like expert aitla like, alagal ഒരാളുകൾക്കുണ്ടാവുന്നൊരുണ്ടാവുന്നില്ലിപ്പ്ജോയ്ഡ് ബൈ all even though there are difference in the degree and level of power it is not always concentrated on top levels next day, politics organizational politics are plans tactics and strategies for seizing holding extracting and executing power in organization politics refers to the structure and process of the use of authority and the power to effect a definition of goals direction and the other major parameters of the organization individual factors like personality traits and organizational factors like democratic decision making influencing to individual behavior common political behaviors are inducement persuasion creation of obligation and coercion uh, politics means uh, the uh, uh, plans tactics and strategies for holding or executing power in an organization it is the plan and the strategies for executing power that is the politics politics may be uh, influenced by individual factors or organizational factors individual factors like personality traits or whatever organizational factors like decision making then the common political behaviors are inducement persuasion obligation and coercion inducement means manager offers to give something to someone else in return for that individual support then persuasion means it release on both the emotion and the logic then creation of obligation try to create the obligation then coercion use of force to get the one's way that is coercion then conflict uh we are familiar about the conflict the conflict, conflict means disagreement or frustration between parties uh, the organizations are uh, built up with the human beings so there is a uh, high chance for conflict between them conflict can be defined as the struggle between incompatible or opposing needs wishes ideas interest of people conflict arises when an individual or groups encounter goals that both the parties cannot obtain satisfactorily it is any situation in which two or more parties feel themselves on opposition then conflict means the disagreement or uh, frustration or confusion between the parties that is the conflict
then types of conflict conflict can be classified into four categories individual conflict intergroup conflict interorganization conflict and intra organizational conflict first one individual conflict individual conflict can be classified again classified into two intra individual conflict and inter individual conflict under intra individual conflict it again classified into uh, frustration goal conflict and role conflict intra individual conflict means uh, the conflict arising from uh, one's mind within an individual that is within the mind of an individual then conflict from frustration means when a motivated drive is blocked before a person reaches a desired goal that is from frustration then goal conflict this is due to the existence of two or more competing goals then what can be uh, accepted and what we can reject it occurs when the attainment of one goal avoids the possibility of attaining another goal that is the goal conflict it may be three types approach approach conflict approach avoidance conflict avoidance avoidance conflict approach approach conflict parayendana vachal individually is motivated to approach two or more positive but mutually exclusive goals two positive goals then it creates confusion what can which can accept that is goal that is approach approach conflict next one approach avoidance conflict approach avoidance conflict means uh, here the uh, individual is motivated to approach which is uh, both the um, negative and positive characteristics that is individual or or goal is all that but it is positive and negative ipo malayalam nammal or proverb parayarille kaichittu accept cheyan pattunnilla adhe pole madhil chittittu oriyavakkan pattatha avasthe illa adhe pole la approach aanu approach awareness conflict or goal ne thane positive and negative aspects und then uh, we can confusion again uh, regards with the accept or reject the next avoidance avoidance conflict that is uh, different goals with the negative characteristics rendu negative ulladana appo rendu accept cheyan pattadulla oru situation that is avoidance avoidance conflict these are the different types of goal conflict next role conflict the uh, role conflict is the third category of intra individual conflict it arises when an individual play several roles simultaneously but finding time and resources in adequate to do so that is different roles played by a single individual it may creates some problems to him that is a uh, role conflict these are all uh, these are the classification of intra individual conflict inter individual conflict means interpersonal conflict arises between two individuals having competition for achieving uh, status promotion resource in organization etc this arises due to the clash ego clash that is personality difference ego status anala karyangal that is the in, in, different individuals thamilla conflict that is inter individual conflict then types of conflict the second one inter group conflict inter group conflict means conflict between uh, two groups in an organization that may be two departments in an organization and etc that is inter group conflict it may otherwise called organizational conflict that is next third one inter organization conflict inter organization means conflict means uh, the conflict with the uh, different organizations then last one intra organizational conflict that means uh, the conflict arises in the organization it may be in the form of inter inter individual conflict or inter group conflict different types of intra organizational conflict are horizontal conflict vertical conflict line and staff conflict horizontal conflict means conflict between employee or department at the same level in an organization for example conflict between purchase department and human resource department in an organization the next day, vertical conflict it uh, it is means uh, the conflict between superior subordinate superior and subordinate sir the next line and staff conflict it between the line members and the staff members in an organization these are the intra organizational conflict
Next, conflict management. Following are the uh, remedial actions. Uh, following are the uh, precautions for uh, reducing uh, conflict in the organization. First one, establishing common goal. Establishing common goal means uh, pro provide, uh, providing a proper goal in an organization. Then uh, it is highly related with the concept management by objectives. Then in an organization followed a common goal, then all activities are um, integrated to that goal. So we can uh, reduce the conflict. Next, change in organization structure. Change in organization structure can be done in the following ways. First one, reduction in interdependence. Then reduction of sharing space resources, exchange persons, appointment of special integrators, reference to superiors. That means um, then uh, when a conflict arises in an organization, uh, we can uh, restructure it by in the this, uh, certain ways. Next, stress management. Stress is defined as a state of psychological and physiological imbalance resulting from the disparity between situational demand and the individual's ability and motivation to meet those needs. Stress may be positive or negative. Stress is good when the situations offer an opportunity to a person to gain something. It acts as a motivator for peak performance. Stress is negative when a person faces social, physical, organizational, and emotional problems. Stress means physiological or psychological imbalance. That is the stress. Stress is positive on our negative on our. Then uh, stress is good when the situation offers an opportunity to a person to gain something. That is, um, for uh, it gives an opportunity for higher performance. Then it is negative when person face social, physical, and other problems. Stress management. Organizational strategies for uh, managing stress are first one, encouraging more of organizational communication with the employees so that there is no role, ambiguity, or conflict. That is, uh, the high communication uh, provides relaxed to employees and uh, it also helpful to. Uh, reducing stress. Uh, second one, encourage employees participation in decision making. The participation also helpful to reduce their stress. Uh, it provides a uh, feeling of security to them. Next, they provide in in independence to employees. Then uh, provide a freedom to a freedom which is necessary to uh, to their job. Then organizational goals should be clear, realistic, stimulating, and particular. That means uh, the uh, clear and uh, attainable goals can be set. Next, encourage decentralization. Encourage decentralization means uh, give uh, some kind of authority to employees also. Have a fair and just a distribution of incentives. Then that means uh, have a reasonable uh, incentives to outstanding performers safe working conditions. That means uh, following uh, safe and secured working conditions to employees. Appreciate the employees. That means the appreciate employees who work more than the expectation. Stress work meditation. I'm going to carry on the organization of morning you promote the yoga. I'm going to carry on the Then next day. Organizational culture. Organizational culture encompasses values and behaviors that contribute to unique social and psychological environment of a business. The organizational culture influences the way of people interact, the context with the, in which the knowledge is created, the resistance they will have towards certain changes, ultimately the way they share knowledge. The organizational culture represents collective values, beliefs, and principles of organizational members. Culture includes the organization's vision, values, norms, systems, symbols, languages, assumptions, environment, location, beliefs, and habits. Elements of culture includes social organization, customs and tradition, language, arts and culture, religion, forms of government, economic system. 
A strong culture is a set of habits, norms, expectations, traditions, symbols, values, and techniques that greatly influences the behavior of its members. That means organizational culture means values and behaviors that contribute to the unique social and psychological environment of a business. Uh, it means the uh, values, beliefs, uh, then principles, rules, regulations uh, are followed by the organization. The organization culture may be strong or weak. A strong culture is a set of habits, norms, expectations, traditions, symbol, value, technique that greatly influence the behavior of its, its members. The weak culture is the individual is uh, are not uh, have little impact on the norm, symbol, and tradition of the organization. There is very little impact on them. That is weak culture. Then types of organizational culture. First one, academic culture. Academic culture depends on employees who are highly skilled. That is bright. Then bright people employees. Uh, you know, depending on the culture and academic culture, then they are ready to study always. They are ready to uh, update, uh, up to date. Next, uh, normative culture. Normative culture is very dry, follows strict regulation and guidelines. That is, uh, the employees are uh, followed what is rule they should follow. Otherwise, uh, they do nothing. That is, normative culture. Then, pragmatic culture. In this case, employees are more practical. And will not strictly adhere the rules and regulation. That is, they are taking decisions uh, with the, uh, related with the practical aspects. Sometimes they may break rules, but uh, what is needed, they do it. Then, club culture. This type of culture requires employees to be very skilled and competent in their work. E club culture follows in organization, le, a very high educational qualification, le, good working experience, le, employees. Le, ane, Normally, higher J another. Then, baseball team culture. It considers the employees as most treasured position of the organization. Employees are the true assets of the organization. Then, they provide a high role in employees in the organization. That is the baseball team culture. These are the types of organizational culture. Then, organizational development. It is focused on improving the effectiveness of organization and the people in those organization. The field of organization development is concerned with the performance, development, and effectiveness of human organization. Kurt Levin is considered as the founding father of organizational development. Kurt Levin, uh, then organizational development may be defined as a complex strategy intended to change belief, attitude, value, and structure of an organization so that they can better adapt to new technologies, markets, and challenges. It is a systematic approach to a planned stage. Certainly, I concept of organization development the concept of the popular idea. Organizational development of the then it means improving effectiveness of organization. That, that is the complex strategy intended to change the belief, attitude, value, and uh, structure of the organization so that they can better adapt to new technologies. The main objective of organizational development is to then establish relationship with the key persons. That is the main objective. Then next we discuss about the process of organizational development. First one, problem identification. That means uh, identify the problems in all area of the organization. But the problem is identified correctly, it is easy to solve them. Next, data collection. Collect necessary data relating to that person, uh, that problems. We can collect the data through the personal interview, observation, question, ex, uh, question error, etc. Then diagnosis. The third step is diagnosis. When the data is collected, it should be carefully analyzed and ex, um, examined uh, by using experience and judgment. The next planning and implementation. 
after diagnosing, uh, then we can uh, set a proper plan for future. Then organizational development interventions come into picture here. Then we can consider the action for the future development. Last step for evaluation and feedback. With the help of feedback, it is possible to find how accurate the organizational development process has been done. These are the process of organizational development. The next area, techniques of organizational development. Uh, techniques means tools uh, used in organizational development. The first one, sensitivity training. Sensitivity training are uh, established by uh, Kurt Levin. Under this method, uh, uh, um, it includes trainer and a group of 10 to 15 selected persons. Then uh, the persons have uh, an opportunity to express their ideas. That is sensitivity training. Then second one, managerial grid. Managerial grid means uh, it identifies two dimensions. Uh, then uh, dimensions of management behavior. First one, people-oriented uh, dimension and uh, production-oriented uh, dimension. People-oriented dimension is a more human resource-friendly approach. The next third one, survey feedback. A number of activities like data collection, feedback, information, survey feedback. Then process consultation. Under this technique, the expert provides necessary guidance or advice to how the participant can solve his own problems. That is process consultation. Then third party peacekeeping. It is developed by Richard E. Walton. Third party involves to uh, solve interpersonal and intergroup conflict. Or arbitrage of conflict uh, reduce. Yeah. Then team building. It is an organization development technique which emphasizes on team building or booming work group in order to improve effectiveness. That is team building. Then management by objective. Achieving organization objective and uh, evaluation and review of performance. Then brainstorming. Brainstorming normality is a technique uh, which focuses on more participation and less criticism. Criticism is allowed only at the end of the discussion. That is brainstorming. Then quality circle. Under the system, a group of uh, 5 to 12 people come together and their own um, opinions are provided. Then they discuss a problem and uh, take the action that is quality circles the last uh, transactional analysis it is propounded by eric Berne. transactional analysis means uh, under the uh, transaction analysis the Berne says that uh, there are three types of ego status super ego adult ego parent ego then uh, we can develop a more adult ego status in the organization uh, then uh, uh, Eric Berne suggested three types of ego status, uh, then child ego, adult ego, and uh, parent ego. Then child ego and parent ego status are dangerous in an organization. So people are more concentrated on adult ego status. That is transactional analysis. Then organizational change. Organizational change refers to the alteration of work environment in an organization. It is the alteration of structural relationship and the role of the people in the organization. Alteration of work environment in the organization due to change in new equilibrium is formed. It is a never ending process. Problem of new adjustment, change affects entire organization. It is organizational change means the uh, material alteration of work environment in the organization, modification of work environment in the organization. That is organizational change. The modification can be done in the form of alteration of work environment, then due to change in equilibrium, and so on. Then the different types of organizational change are technological or mechanical changes in methods and procedure, process changes, system change, and structural change. First one, technological or mechanical change. This may be due to change in technology or machinery. Then, change in methods and procedures means when the methods or procedures are changing, there should be a corresponding organizational change. That means uh, the methods or procedures are changing, then there may be a changes in the organization. 
then process change a collection of activities to be taken one or more kind of input and create an output that is a value to the customers that is process change then system change system change means set of procedure then it is possible through the network of computers that is system change that is the changes in the computer system that is structural change it's a structural change means macro change and it is the integration of regularities which arise when group of people get together in pursuit of common purpose it is a macro change it uh, focuses on the structure of the organization then these are the areas of human resource management uh, the last part the model questions you can uh, try to answer these questions if you have any doubts please ask to me Thank you, Miss. Okay, if you have any doubts, please ask me. 